uh, welcome everybody to today's seminar. The topic for today is uh, traumatic brain injury. And uh, we've had uh, several sessions earlier also on neurocritical care. We've covered subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, we've covered intracranial tension, then intracranial hemorrhage, stroke, and now traumatic brain injury. And uh, Professor Sir uh, is going to be speaking today. Sir is a luminary in, in uh, neurosurgery in our country and abroad. Uh, amongst many achievements, uh, Sir is the editor for Neurology India. He is the president of the Indian Skull Based Surgery Society of India. He is the president elect Cerebrovascular Society of India. He is chair Epilepsy Surgery AOEC International League Against Epilepsy. He is president Indian Epilepsy Society of India. Uh, in charge of the epilepsy surgery developing countries. And uh, he has several publications, around 500 publications, including NEJM and Nature, the most prestigious journals, and over 7,000 citations. And uh, very importantly, he has nine patents. So, sir is uh, one of the great neurosurgeons and the scientists, I would say, in our country. So, thank you, sir, for taking the time out and uh, making this presentation and uh, sharing it on this platform. Thank you very much. And uh, we have uh, Saurabh Anand, who has been a great contributor to our sessions. Thank you, Saurabh. He is uh, Chief of Neuroanesthesia and Neurocritical Care at Artemis, a very dedicated and uh, very bright uh, neuroanesthetician uh, intensivist. Mm -hmm. that, I think we'll start now. Please put your questions in the chat box. Over to you, sir. So thank you very much, Dr. Tapesh and Dr. Saurabh for giving me this opportunity to speak on this very exhaustive, but very, very important topic which happens to be the bread and butter of every neurosurgeon, every uh, person involved in trauma care, every intensivist, whether we like it or not, whenever we are working in a tertiary hospital center or even a small center, uh, these are the cases which we cannot avoid. So when I was given this topic, obviously it's too huge, you know, it goes into textbooks. So the idea is what should I concentrate? So I thought the best way will be to perhaps give a very brief introduction of head injuries because I am speaking to an audience who already has a significant uh, knowledge on this pathology. And then I would go on to the current evidence levels of evidence, which is available for treatment of head injuries or use of various drugs or monitoring for various types uh, for various types of monitoring, what we require for head injuries and what is the current level of evidence and how it is to be taken. Not that just because the evidence is there, we should always use it, but under what context should we use it. And at the end of the day, we know that everything is left to the individual clinical decision. The guidelines, the evidence, they only provide some kind of a background information. But ultimately, when you come to one-to-one -to -one for treating the patient, it is the individual decision of the physician and the treating team which matters. So uh, there is nothing much to say regarding the incidence of head injuries in uh, India. We have the highest incidence of head injuries all over the globe. And it is not surprising because now we have the largest uh, population and our uh, tertiary healthcare is not very well established. We do not have very good paramedic systems and definitely any hospital which is established becomes overburdened with cases of head injuries. And it is very important to form a holistic picture where the caregivers, the attendants, uh, or people who are taking care of the patients, the doctors, everybody understand you know, what are the possible outcomes, what we can do. Often in our country, whenever a patient has a severe head injury, the whole family rushes the patient of head injury to uh, some uh, hospital where obviously they need to charge for treatment because treatment of head injuries is obviously, you know, it's not something which is uh, uh, trivial. And then after three, four days, their finances run out. They're not able to plan for what is there for future. They're not able to understand the prognosis. So it's very important to keep up the communication right from day one so that the caregivers and the, or the relatives or attendants of the patient understand uh, what is exact prognosis we are dealing upon and what be their long-term strategies. So, uh, here I could only say that no head injury is minor enough to be ignored. Uh, 
or no head injury is severe enough to be neglected. So head injury is something I would say where a lot has happened since the time I was I have been doing my residency, but unfortunately has not translated much into outcomes. The outcomes which we see today more or less are the same. And when I meet somebody like Professor Tandon, whom I meet once a month at his residence, he often quotes a study which he presented from Ames somewhere in 1970s in the World Congress for Neurosurgery. And when he presented the data, his outcome of head injuries in a place like Ames at that time, it was not, you know, they did not have everything. They did not have all kinds of monitoring devices or healthcare. All they had is a basic care. And his outcomes of patient outcomes of the patients which he presented were not very much different from really high class institutes like Montreal Neurological Institute, where they did every kind of monitoring. But despite that, there was not much gap in terms of outcomes between these two group of patients. And this is what he even recollects now was what was, you know, contested and which was thoroughly discussed and debated that despite the technology that is in 1970s, not much of difference has been achieved in terms of outcomes between a high end center or a low end center. And I think the situation is same today. We have institutes where every kind of advanced technology is applied to a patient with head injury versus institutes which can provide very basic care. But the most important thing is the fundamentals of taking care in the intensive care department uh, and the long-term rehabilitation, which actually makes a difference. So we all know about the primary injuries, secondary injuries, and I would not speak about much, but head injury is a very complex affair. It is just not an injury to one area. You have so many factors acting upon it, which include a direct mechanical factor like a coup, contract coup, or rotational or shear injuries. And in addition, you also have uh, various other factors which include the uh, uh, Blood, blood pressure, the raised intracranial pressure, the rate in which the secondary uh, secondary injury comes into play, the kind of care the patient receives at the site of head injury, how fast the patient is transferred to a uh, area where he has to be to a hospital where he has to be taken care of, to what is the maintenance of the ABC. So there are so many fa factors which are acting upon a patient of head injury, and I think the most important factors would be threefold. A, to prevent head injury. I think that is the best treatment for head injury to prevent it. B, creating a very good paramedic team so that the patients can be taken care at the site of accident. We spend crores of rupees in creating ICUs and hospitals. But if we spend a fraction of this money in training paramedics so that the paramedic team can be deployed to take care of the patient at the site of the accident accident. And thirdly, education of the public. So if they see a patient at the site of head injury, what they should do. In most of the other countries, whenever they find a head injury, every person knows what is to be taken. They will put the patient straight. They will put them on a hard board. They will even turn them to one side, suck out all the secretions. So all of them are aware about the ABC. Whereas in India, you know, most often, unfortunately, what people do is they will just start, start recording it on the video and send it at WhatsApp and no care is provided at the site of accident. So if these three issues are the issues which have to be addressed, and then when the patient comes to a tertiary or a hospital, rest of the factors more or less remain same. Because I believe the physicians at every tertiary hospital, including private hospitals, are geared well enough on how to handle the patient of head injury at the level of hospital. So this could be the various pathological uh, lesions. Again, I will not speak about it, but a significant chunk. In fact, the majority of my presentation today is going to be about giving a bird's eye view on what is the current status of head injury management monitoring. What is the level of evidence available? And in what context can we apply this evidence for the treatment of patient? And we know there are several levels of evidence. So evidence one is the randomized uh, 
double blinded trial which we call as level evidence level 1 evidence which every physician would like to have but unfortunately we cannot have this in every situation there are various reasons and level 7 is an opinion from authorities so earlier we used to have only five levels of evidence but right now we have seven levels of evidence and again uh, two is split into 2a and 2b yeah, but for all practical purposes we can say that we have level 1 to level 7 evidence now how should we examine the evidence and what context should we examine the evidence should we demand that there should be evidence for every treatment modality which is available the answer is no and to answer it well i would like you to read this very nice and interesting article which is uh let me see i cannot see it properly that's right uh, which has been published in british medical journal which is on the parachute used to prevent death and major trauma related to gravitational challenge and they did a systemic review of randomized controlled trials and they wanted to establish a establish whether parachutes are actually safe or not and they did a systemic review of randomized controlled trial from all possible sources and then uh, they wanted to study the effects of a parachute using a free fall and they defined death and disability and they were unable to identify any randomized control trial so in conclusion they said that because there are no randomized control trials available it is high time we need a class one evidence for parachutes so we suggest that every person jumping from a plane should have either a placebo or a real parachute so this actually is a mock uh, paper which uh, provides a satire on the uh, need for which is created by the physicians or the um, uh, need which is asked by several physicians for emphasizing on class one evidence so we have to understand that there are certain areas where we cannot get class one evidence and there are several reasons a we may not have that number of patients where it would be possible for us to get a class one evidence b we may be investigating on a technique which is so well established that nobody will try to do away this technique or they will not uh, go forward not to use this technique so it becomes a standard of care for instance icp icp is a standard of care now if you ask some hospital that please do a double blinded study on one patient is not doing icp other patients doing icp the physician is going to refuse he will say i'm going to put half of my patients into danger i need icp monitoring so that i know what is the status of the brain swelling so that is an area where you simply cannot have a class one evidence as of now and then thirdly is the uniformity of treatment we know that whenever we do a multi system multi trial multi uh, university or multi center trial you know the uniformity of treatment which is given is not always the same and finally and last but not the least the number of variable factors which actually is very very complex for head injury for instance every patient of head injury is in a cocktail of drugs uh, so how do you determine that how one therapy is actually modifying or influencing the other therapy for you to come to a certain uh, to a conclusion that this particular treatment is effective or not so let's start with each of the therapy which we are quite familiar with and i the way i will go is i will give a background to show how it is of use in uh, the current scenario and then what is the evidence available and what is the final recommendation what is the current status so decompressive craniotomy over the past one decade has become the mainstay treatment of most of the pathologies of head injuries so even for contusions even for intracerebral hematomas uh, surgeons prefer to do a decompressive because of several reasons a it is quite straight forward to do b it is an extra cranial procedure so you're not tampering with the brain c it is a procedure by which you immediately reduce the icp and that itself has a major effect on the recovery of the patients uh, and uh, Uh, for the response is very good because we know that the biggest trauma in patients with head injury is raised icp uh, 
So you are able to control that, you are able to reduce the secondary injuries. Now prior people have attempted various RCTs uh, to understand the role of decompressive craniotomy. But unfortunately, these RCTs were not very well conducted. And then we had the famous Decrat trial, which was uh, conducted over 15 tertiary centers in Australia, New Zealand, and Saudi Arabia till 2010. And this actually showed uh, that a decompressive craniotomy could actually be more harmful. And later on, people have criticized the way which, in which this trial was performed. And most recently we have come and this is how the trial was done. And there has been a lot of criticism on it, which I will not go through here, but it will suffice to say that yes, the DECRA trial did show that decompressive was perhaps not so effective. And then finally we had this landmark trial called as a rescue ICP trial. So this involved 52 centers from 20 countries. And uh, let me minimize this. And 70% of the patients were recruited in UK, which was conducted till 2014. Uh, and uh, it mainly included traumatic brain injuries with an abnormal CT scan and raised pressure of more than 25 millimeters of mercury for up to 12 hours, despite doing all kinds of therapy, which is mentioned here. Now, People, patients who were excluded were patients with bilateral fixed and dilated peoples or with bleeding diathesis or an injury which was considered to be unsurvivable. Now, in this, over 2,000 patients were randomized. And the baseline characteristics, one of the things which was most appreciated were that the baseline characteristics of either group was absolutely similar. Now, the intervention which was done was uh, continued in stage one and two treatment with a decompressive craniotomy. So patient under, underwent a unilateral frontotemporal craniotomy or a hemicraniectomy versus medical treatment. The control group had medical treatment and medical treatment included stage one, two and stage three was commenced if the intracranial pressure was more than 25 millimeters of mercury for one to two years after initiation of stage two treatment. So the stage one therapy consisted of head elevation, ventilation, sedation, analgesia, paralysis, which was optional, monitoring of CVP, arterial blood pressure, intracranial pressure. Stage two therapy was commenced if the intracranial pressure remained more than 25 millimeters of mercury. And it included ventriculostomy, inotropes, mannitol, hypotonic saline, loop diuretics, hypothermia. Now barbiturates were not permitted the reason is that barbiturates, uh, there are several controversies why it was not permitted. And now patients were uh, allocated the medical group uh, or a decompressive group. And again, crossover was allowed, which means that if a patient continued to deteriorate in the medical group, he could undergo a decompressive. Or similarly, if a patient was randomized for a decompressive craniotomy and chose to undergo medical treatment, then again, he was crossed over to medical treatment. Now the most important result, the results are quite complex, but I would like this current audience to understand that the most important result of rescue IP ICP trial was that it made a significant impact in reducing the death rate. So the death rates literally halved, reduced by 50% in patients who underwent decompressive craniotomy, which is very encouraging. But if you look at Glasgow outcome score at 12 months, here definitely you can see that the death rate was much less in people who underwent uh, decompressive craniotomy. But again, people who were in a vegetative state was higher, which means a person who's undergoing decompressive craniotomy had a higher incidence of becoming vegetative, which can again put a long-term burden on the patient's attendants or caregivers if the patient has a serious head injury. But it is also possible that a lot of patients who would have otherwise died have now been saved because of decompressive craniotomy. So this is one of the few uh, studies in head injury where the class one evidence is available. And this should be the take home message for this current group that yes, rescue ICP trial was a landmark trial which showed reduction of death rate by 
but it also showed increased incidence of vegetative states. And that is the reason why uh, decompressive is now uh, practiced for most of the head injuries. Now, what are the strengths and weaknesses? Now, obviously the strength was that it was a randomized control trial. Now, there were similar number of patients in both the groups and the uh, epidemiological characteristics of both the patients were same. But what are the weakness? The biggest weakness was the slow recruitment over 10 years. With 50% of the centers recruiting only three or fewer patients. So obviously the recruitment was very slow. Now, therapeutic hypothermia, which was optional in stage two, may have a deleterious effect on neurological outcome uh, based on another study. So we now know that hypothermia sometimes could be deleterious, especially when you do a rapid rewarming of hypothermia. So that has been one of the criticisms that in medical treatment, when you are giving therapeutic hypothermia, is it that many of these patients or some of these patients at least have developed complications of related to hypothermia. Now, another major weakness was clinical teams who cared for the patients were aware of the trial group assignment. So obviously when you see the patient, you know whether he's under he or she is under medical therapy or surgical therapy. And that kind of changes your bias. So perhaps internally, you know, you may be a little bit more radical with patients who have undergone decompressive. So you can say that these patients are undergone decompressive, so higher chances of this patient surviving versus who is on medical treatment. Now, a large proportion of patients in the medical group crossed over to decompressive. So approximately one third of the medical group crossed over to decompressive craniotomy. Now, when we participated in the STITCH trial, I participated, I went and, you know, uh, with uh, the Newcastle Professor Mandelo, we participated in all the, and I learned a lot of statistics and I was fascinated how people tackle large scale uh, trials. So whenever you have a crossover, the crossover tends to kind of dilute the observational effect. For instance, the final uh, conclusion of stitch trial, which was a randomized control trial for hypertensive bleed for medical versus surgical therapy was that medic surgical therapy doesn't have much of benefit. But what people forget is that this is only for the group of patients where either surgery or medical therapy was equivocal. So the physician was in doubt whether to do surgical therapy or medical therapy. So you have a hematoma where the patient is deteriorating, definitely you have to do surgery. Similarly, you have a patient who is GCS3 with a hematoma, you know, you will not be much encouraged to do surgery. Secondly, we also had one third of the patients who underwent medical treatment also crossing over to surgical treatment. Now, the problem with this is that when medically treated patients cross over to surgical treated patients, so the overall outcome may be, you know, not so good because you may have been giving the surgical treatment at a later stage. So again, that is a problem of uh, statistics. So the current status of decompressive craniotomy, which is a take home message is that it is well accepted as a mode of therapy for surgery for head injuries, moderate to severe injuries. It is helpful to reduce ICP, reduce mortality and is of benefit for moderate head injuries. Incidence, obviously it's not indicated in patients where pupils are dilated and fixed or very severe head injuries. Incidence on long-term vegetative states may be higher for decompressive craniotomies. So this has to be taken into account whenever you're counseling the patients that yes, we do the decompressive, the patient may survive, but you have to be ready for long-term vegetative effect. The next issue, which is again, very widely debated is the role of prophylactic hypothermia. So again, you know, we have, uh, we have, a weak body of evidence for class two and class three, but we do have significant uh, type one evidence and all of them have not shown any much benefit of hypothermia. Now with this, let us go to individual things. So one is hypothermia versus normothermia. Again, there is no difference of mortality or neurological outcome. Now, many people have suggested that hypothermia was not quickly induced to produce a benefit in normothermic patients. 
and it is also to be understood very important that rewarming of a patient who is in hypothermia is detrimental so that can lead to rhabdomyolysis it can lead to renal failure so whenever you are rewarming a patient please do not do it suddenly so be careful that if you are decided to give mild hypothermia please ensure that the rewarming should be done very very carefully and you have to monitor the core body temperature from the rectum now there was not much difference in uh, the complications but definitely the pulmonary infections were uh, higher in hypothermia group and finally there could be some beneficial effect of mild hypothermia but again it is left to the treating physician definitely there is no role of moderate or severe hypothermia that leads to severe complications but yes in certain situations one may carry out mild hypothermia but again be careful when you are rewarming the patient now the considering long versus shorter duration hypothermia is there any evidence so there is one study you know which studied 215 patients and it concluded that the patient who has been cooled for 5 days had better outcome than those who were cooled for 2 days but again you know this has to be taken with a pinch of salt because it's a class 3 evidence from a single study and you have to be very careful when you are doing it in your own institute there are also been some studies on head versus systemic cooling where definitely the head cooling has much less incidence of complications and it also has a lesser incidence higher beneficial rate for uh, head cooling only so the current status is hypothermia is not beneficial head cooling may be beneficial so if you have head cooling yes you can please go ahead and try that uh, mild hypothermia could be of benefit uh, but again be very careful about rewarming uh, because if you rapidly rewarm again it could lead to a lot of problems now let's come to another mainstay of uh, treatment which is hyperosmolar therapy which is basically mannitol and hypotonic saline how useful it is how long we should give and what is the role in reducing icp because we use it like tap water every patient who comes in head injury immediately you start mannitol now here we should understand that when we give mannitol it is an osmotic diuretic so mannitol is only functional when the blood brain barrier is intact so even though it does reduce the icp in patients with head injuries the way it reduces icp is by reducing the swelling of the normal brain so it does not act upon the abnormal brain so the swelling of the normal brain reduces that is first thing to understand the second thing to understand is that initially when you start with mannitol there is a slight rise of icp sometimes it could be detrimental because of the osmotic diuretic effect the intravascular volume increases so it is good to combine mannitol always with a uh, loop diuretic so you can give a loop diuretic along with mannitol that will be safer than using mannitol alone and of course there are number of other act actions of mannitol like anti oxidant effect it has a capillary uh, it increases the cerebral perfusion so many other mechanisms of action are present now the standard guidelines is that mannitol is effective for control of raised icp at 0.25 grams per kg to 1 gram per kg arterial hypotension should be avoided so it's very important to maintain the systolic blood pressure at least more than 100 or 110 now 90 is the recommended guidelines but we all know that 90 is too low a number so it should not fall below 110 now oh, obviously when the patient is herniating so you have an extradural hematoma who is rapidly deteriorating in consciousness or some kind of transtemporal herniation you have to give mannitol before the patient can be shifted to ot so definitely it's the life saving measure whenever we need to shift the patient to ot and during the transit time one can give mannitol and now there are these are the various studies comparing mannitol with hypotonic saline and what do they show 
Now, there are studies which have shown that hypotonic saline may be more effective than mannitol in lowering the intracranial pressure, but there is no difference in short term mortality. And the cumulative burden of ICP, which is defined as the number of days with an ICP spike of more than 25 millimeters of mercury, that was significantly lower in hypotonic saline as compared to mannitol. Similarly, the daily ICP burden has also been shown to be significantly lower whenever hypotonic saline has been used. So these results suggest that hypotonic saline may have an edge over mannitol, but obviously, you know, in the books, they will say that we will need additional data. Uh, so, but definitely hypotonic saline is a good replacement of mannitol and it has uh, effect of reducing ICP both over the short term period as well as the long term period. So what is the current status? The indications of mannitol remain the same. It is to be used in acute situation. Hypotonic saline may have a better effect to reduce the ICP. So uh, Dr. Tapas, am I clear till now? I hope uh, it is not. Uh... No, so it's clear, sir. Okay. So next important modality of treatment is CSF fluid drainage. So CSF fluid drainage sometimes is a life-saving measure, even though in most of the cases, the ventricles are chinned because of raised ICP. But if we can do a neuro navigation guided placement of a ventricular catheter, it really works very well. You know, you let out the CSF. So let's look at the evidence. What do the various papers talk about? So you could either have an EVD with an intermittent or a continuous drainage, and you could do a simultaneous intraparenchymal ICP monitoring. So the challenges obviously are, you know, if the ventricles are chinked, then you may have to use neuro navigation. So sometimes the ventricles are not seen at all. That's a challenge. So there have been, these are the two studies, two meta-analysis of use of intermittent versus continuous uh, and also on the use of CSF drainage. So obviously there is no class one evidence because again, it's a mainstay of treatment. You know, if the ventricles are dilated and if the patient is deteriorating, the ICP is high, no pair, no physician in his right frame of mind will not, uh, you know, uh, will not do a ventricular drainage. He will definitely do a ventricular drainage. So again, you know, obviously will not have a class one evidence, but with the papers which have been published, Continuous EVD has been shown to be better than intermittent drainage. So it is better to have a continuous drainage and it can be simultaneously monitored with the uh, intraparent camel ICP. So the current status of CSF drainage is it's indicated to reduce ICP, but is a secondary option to uh, decompressive craniotomy. Decompressive craniotomy is the first option to reduce ICP. Continuous drainage is preferred versus intermittent drainage. Now next come to something which happens to be the core therapy for intensivists. What is the role of ventilation therapies? Has any new evidence come here? Has any other studies been published here? So the physiology is obviously, you know, we know that nowadays we discourage hyperventilation and we like to maintain the PaCO2 in the range of 35 to 45. Now uh, under normal condition, PaCO2 is the most powerful determinant of cerebral blood flow and a range of 20 to 80 is linearly responsible, responsive to PaCO2 and cerebral blood flow is important in meeting the uh, brain's metabolic demands. We all know that. Now low PaCO2 therefore can result in lower cerebral blood flow uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 and can lead to cerebral ischemia. Uh, but high PaCO2 can also result in cerebral hyperemia and increased intracranial pressure. So it is very important to provide the optimal cerebral perfusion rate. Now we all know that hyperventilation produces cerebral ischemia. That's why it's very important to avoid hyperventilation. But saying this, is there any role of hyperventilation? Is it something to be completely discouraged or is there any role? So obviously the literature shows that hyperventilation should be avoided in the first 24 hours after injury. That is when the cerebral blood flow is critically reduced. 
So in the first 24 hours, it's very important to maintain the cerebral blood flow. And after 24 hours, yes, you can try definitely to do hyperventilation. Uh, and if, if at all you do hyperventilation, it is suggested as a temporary measure to reduce the ICP. So for instance, after 24 hours, if the ICP is increasing and you have to shift the patient to the OT to do a decompressive craniotomy and you don't have ventricles and you want to temporarily reduce the ICP, then in that case, you can use hyperventilation as a temporary measure. Now, if at all you do hyperventilation, it is very important to do more advanced monitoring methods like jugular venous oxygen saturation or brain tissue O2 partial pressure. That is what is recommended. Uh, you one should not do hyperventilation without this because if the patient go, if the brain goes into ischemia, we will never come to know about it. Now, all of us quote this study, which is more than 25 years old, which was a landmark paper, which has changed. Before that, every patient was undergoing hyperventilation. But this study definitely showed the deleterious effect of hyperventilation, after which, excuse me. After which, normal ventilation came into the standard mode of treatment. Now, this was the paper, uh, which was this is also a class uh, two evidence which was published by Muizalar in 1991. And they showed, they compared hyperventilation versus control and also hyperventilation with tromethamine versus control. And they found no statistically significant difference. So for patients with a GCS of four to five motor, the three and six month Glasgow outcome scores were significantly lower if hyperventilated patients than in control or tromethamine groups. However, the effect of which basically means, you know, hyperventilation is not to be recommended. So the conclusion is no new data has been added. So as of now, the same recommendations remain, which is avoid hypertension, hyperventilation, especially in the first 24 hours. Concentrate on the cerebral perfusion pressure in the first 24 hours. If at all hyperventilation is given, it can be used like a temporary measure like mannitol. If you have want to reduce it before shifting the patient for a decompressive craniotomy. So the current status is normal ventilation currently is a goal for severe TBI and the POC to range of 35 to 45 is to be maintained. Hyperventilation is recommended as a temporary measure and hyperventilation should be avoided in the first 24 hours, where the cerebral blood flow is critically reduced because of secondary uh, injury. Now, the role of anesthetics, analgesics, and sedatives. So this again is very, very important for the intensivists, what anesthetics should be used, what analgesics should be used, what sedatives to be used, uh, because often the patients of head injuries are restless, they're moving around, you know, sometimes they could go into status uh, and, you know, one may have to uh, do a complete uh, anesthesia, give them a com complete anesthesia. So the situations, you know, an anesthetics, analgesics and sedatives are important and commonly used therapy for acute traumatic brain injury for a variety of reasons, both for prophylaxis and treatment. Now, among this, barbiturates have been used extensively and we all know the mechanism of barbiturates. Firstly, it has a neuroprotective effect. Secondly, it causes sedation whereby it reduces coughing, straining, and uh, uh, so again, that reduces the ICP. So barbiturates is something which is universally accepted. So what are now side effects of anesthetics, analgesics could include hypotension and decreased cardiac output and intrapulmonary shunting, which could lead to hypoxia. So that is one very important thing what one has to take into account, including barbiturates. So whenever you give the cerebral perfusion pressure has to be very, very, uh, very, very rigorously monitored. It is better to avoid any kind of analgesics. You can give analgesics, but any kind of anesthetics in the first 24 hours, especially for moderate to severe head injuries. And if at all required, you could give barbiturate. 
Now, sometimes they could give rise to paradoxical decrease of cerebral perfusion pressure, which may negate the benefits of ICP. In addition, anesthetics like propofol. Now, propofol is something I will not, you know, uh, like to use, even though some of my colleagues swear in favor of it. Because firstly, propofol, you know, uh, does not reduce the ICP very well. Ketamine is much more better than propofol in terms of neuroprotective effect. But again, you require huge doses of ketamine in order to, you know, uh, give complete sedation. Uh, but propofol, you know, the problem with propofol is it's associated with a host of complications like hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, rhabdomyolysis. So these are again, you know, quite risky. And uh, uh, once again, whenever we give, it is very important to give an EEG, continuous EEG monitoring because Dr. Manjiri would have talked about it. So EEG, intra, intra ICU EEG, continuous EEG monitoring is mandatory nowadays because 25% of the patients could be having subclinical seizures. So it's very important to monitor every patient of head injury with a continuous EEG. Or if you don't have that, to do it at least two or three times a day in the ICU. So obviously there is no class one evidence because barbiturates are used extensively. So these are the studies which have been done for prophylactic use of barbiturates, one hour CT, barbiturates as a treatment for raised ICP, sedatives and analgesics. And what is the summary of evidence? We obviously have level 2 which is to be understood. So when we give uh, barbiturates, we need to attain burst suppression on EEG. High dose of barbiturate administration is recommended to control elevated ICP refractory to maximum standard medical and surgical treatment. Hemodynamic uh, stability is very, very important. Uh, so even though propofol is recommended for control of ICP, uh, one has to be, one has to put in a lot of caution because of the morbidity associated with propofol. And there have been, we have to be aware of the propofol infusion syndrome, especially which is common in children. So definitely it should be avoided in uh, children, pediatric head injuries. Now, uh, uh, there have been some studies which have showed the beneficial effect of propofol over morphine. So morphine is something which I would not recommend for head injuries. And there has also been one study where they compared high dose propofol with low dose propofol. While this study, again, level 2B evidence, showed a better outcome for high dose propofol. But again, you know, the complications has to be taken into account. So what is the current status? And this is what I infer. I could be wrong in my inference. And there are many uh, people who may not agree with me. I feel barbiturates are very well established. So that is something which could be safely given. Uh, and in the moderate to severe head injuries, if the ICP is not well controlled, one can start barbiturates. But the first preference should be to monitor the CPP and reduce the ICP. High propofol therapy is again, which could be considered as a uh, last option. You know, it could be, but it should be administered with caution and definitely not in children. Even though they say it's not contraindicated, but definitely I will not prefer it in children. Propofol overall has no greater advantage over barbiturates. Now there should be a caution over side effects of propofol. Now I will not suggest giving pa muscle paralyzing agents like weak curenium or similar agents, because the reason is that it only leads to muscle paralysis. It doesn't lead to neuroprotective effect. So as a result, the patient could go into status, but it would not be visible clinically. And I would also strongly recommend continuous EEG monitoring. If not available, doing EEG at least once or twice a day or maybe three times a day is very, very important to look for subclinical seizures. That is very, very important. And if patient has status, ketamine is the drug of choice, not propofol, not vacuranium. You could start with barbiturates, then go to anticonvulsants, and finally you need to treat with ketamine. I remember we had a patient of ultra refractory status. He was a patient I had operated for a cortical dysplasia. It was a huge cortical dysplasia. So obviously we removed a lot of it, but some was going into the motor strip, which we left behind. 
and following surgery the patient went into a refractory status we had to ultimately control with the ketamine and by the time we controlled with ketamine the dosage required we exhausted all the ketamine in the cn center and we had to call up the stores fellow and he had to urgently get ketamine in the middle of the night but finally the patient was saved so if ketamine is to be used a lot of ketamine has to be used so steroids now it is well established that steroids have absolutely no role in head injuries except except for the fact that if the patient has some kind of an optic nerve injury so there you need to save the optic nerve you could give steroids or there is an associated spine injury you need to give steroids but otherwise per se for head injuries there is no role of steroids and one would not recommend using this so just to summarize the crash trial you know about 10000 patients have been recruited and they were randomized to receive 2 grams of intravenous methylprednisolone and it was halted after 5 years because of the higher high risk of complications from methylprednisolone and death rate so it was not just because of bleeding problems but people did not know what was the cause of increased death rate with methylprednisolone you know so uh, that is why uh, steroids are to be discouraged because they actually increase the death rate now infection prophylaxis now uh, ventilator now situation is the infection is something of uh, great significance so vap or ventilator associated pneumonia is something which every intensivist dreads uh, and severe head injury itself increases the susceptibility for infection similarly if the patient undergoes icp monitoring the infection could be as high as 1/3 in 1/3 of cases and vap is something ventilator associated pneumonia something which every uh, intensivist fears and uh, uh, the occurrence of vap represents a significant morbidity and mortality now what are the recommendations for tracheostomy there is a level 1 evidence uh, there was an insufficient evidence for level 1 because obviously this is again a therapy you know which is life saving so obviously nobody will like to participate in a level 1 evidence now for level 2 it has been shown that early tracheostomy is recommended to reduce mechanical ventilation days so whenever you feel please do not hesitate to do an early tracheostomy in severe moderate to severe head injuries if you feel that the patient is not going to be extubated please do not wait for 7 days please go ahead with early tracheostomy within 2 to 3 days now physicians generally tend to wait for 2 or 3 days and then after 7 days you know they you ask the patient's relative would you like to go tracheostomy and then the relatives are in confusion they are running they you know they uh, they are in lot of stress thinking that again a hole has to be made into trachea should we do it it looks my suggestion is any moderate to severe head injury head injury day one do a tracheostomy along with your surgery compressive craniotomy because by doing that in the first go itself you have done a tracheostomy you will have access to very good toileting you can do very good suctioning and you are going to provide excellent ventilation by which you are going to also support all the other parameters so i think even though we do not practice it i think the same sitting surgery with tracheostomy for moderate and severe head injuries is something we should start practicing so now again this is an interesting paper which showed that povidone iodine k role is not uh, recommended but i don't i will not agree with this completely the reason may be that you know the western population has got very good oral hygiene whereas most of patients we have terrible oral hygiene and if you look into the mouth you know we have this fungal infection uh, we have lot of uh, you know uh, we have caries we have lot of cavities so i think it may not be a bad idea to rigorously take care of oral hygiene uh, but uh, this was a paper i thought i should kind of mention it so it has to be taken with a pinch of salt for local situations for instance in uk in many surgical otis they don't wear shoe covers they say that studies are shown we don't have to wear shoe covers so except for neurosurgery all the other otis they walk in with shoes so that is something we cannot even imagine doing it in india and once you go to those countries you understand because they hardly have any dust 
so it's very clean outside now prophylactic antibiotics uh, now this is a paper where they conducted an rct of 100 critical ill patients and uh, they found that there was a statistically significant reduction of incidence of pneumonia in the treatment group but no incidence of mortality so obviously giving antibiotics is something which every treating physician or surgeon will do it you know you cannot say that there is no role of antibiotics and nobody is going to stop but the question is how do we tackle the long term antibiotic therapy and how long should we give antibiotic therapy do we go on giving it for two weeks three weeks or can we reduce and stop now that is something for which i'm not finding any evidence in literature so obviously what we do is we continue giving antibiotics and after some time we switch over to a lower antibiotics we do cultures culture grows multiple organisms in chronic head injuries we try to give something else so it's always a challenge to treat chronic head injuries especially when they stay for one month two months three months they're on trichostomy they keep on growing uh, and i think the way to tackle it is to maintain very good physiotherapy uh, to do excellent dvt prophylaxis and also to mobilize as early as possible and all the other such adjuvant therapies would do well to reduce uh, antibiotic uh, you know inf uh, infections and also preventing long term antibiotic therapy now there is a study which showed which is a level 3 study showing that anti mighty antimicrobial impregnated catheters when we use especially for evds may be considered you know they may reduce the risk of infections but again one has to understand that these are terribly expensive so i think it is much better to take the chabra's shunt tube or ventricular tube and maybe wash it well with vancomycin solution and then use it i have been doing that and we have found it to be very very good rather than using antimicrobial impregnated catheters which unnecessarily increases the expense in our icu now dvt prophylaxis so this is something which is an again a nightmare for all the intensivists because there is almost a 50 percent incidence of dvt for moderate to severe injuries uh, and uh, there have been studies where dvt occurred in one third of moderate to severe head injuries in some studies 50 percent uh, and uh, it is definitely something and these are the important predictors so old age presence of subarachnoid hemorrhage injury severity score of more than 15 extremity injury so on these are the predictors of dvt and uh, uh, there has been an increase of three to four times in traumatic brain injuries despite the use of mechanical and chemo prophylaxis so this is something which should be instituted as early as possible so again i went through the evidence so level one and two there is insufficient evidence again to be understood in level three definitely the role of low molecular weight heparin is coming up in a big way and uh, but however again there is an increased risk of expansion of intracranial hemorrhage so the current status is that mechanical uh, dvt prophylaxis should be instituted on day zero itself and low molecular weight should be instituted maybe three or four days as soon as the acute problem is over and it is very important to do regular screening for dvt now next we come to anti epileptic prophylaxis anti epileptic drug prophylaxis now we all know that post traumatically a patient could have early seizures which is within 7 days or late seizures after 7 days so there is a classification called as immediate or ultra early which is within 24 hours but that has no relevance in terms of long term outcomes so it's simple to remember the cutoff point of 7 days less than 7 days or more than 7 days and similarly post traumatic epilepsy is recurrent seizures happening more than 7 days now uh, the incidence could be as high as 12 to 15 percent and subclinical seizures on EEG could be seen in approximately one fourth of the patients in severe traumatic brain injury so that is why you know it's a very mandatory armamentarium to have a continuous EEG monitoring and what are the risk factors so low glos glasgow coma score having immediate seizures post-traumatic amnesia for more than 30 minutes now i you know we did a study at aims and i this is actually based on a very very old study 
and I don't know how relevant it is because in our study we never found amnesia to be a risk factor for, but somehow this is quoted in all the papers. Now, obviously, if you have a depressed fracture or a penetrating head injury or a hematoma, again, that is a risk. So, age of you know more than this, I'm sorry, this is more than 65 years or alcoholism is again a risk. Now, post-traumatic epilepsy again more or less has the same uh, risk factors. Now, something new is that more uh, people are using levetiracetam more and more commonly. Earlier, people used to use phenytoin and valproid, uh, but in developed countries and most of the traumatic centers, uh, uh, tertiary centers, people are using more and more levetiracetam. And the recent studies, I discussed this with Manjari. She said uh, that she is currently involved in one RCT. And there are a lot of papers coming up showing the beneficial effect of levetiracetam, even though in the traumatic guidelines, you know, they still say that it's kind of equivocal, doesn't have much benefit over ferritoin. Now, so obviously there is no level one evidence at this point of time. And now prophylactic use of phenytoin or valproate is not recommended for preventing post-traumatic seizures. And uh, now we, one has to understand that anti-epileptic drugs are not actually anti-epileptic, they're anti-seizures. So continuing to give this anti-epileptic drugs for six months, one year has absolutely no use. Now, in fact, if you continue giving it, uh, the, they could end up having more complications. So now these are the recent studies where they have shown levetiracetam is actually better tolerated than phenytoin or valproate. Now, what is the current status? Now, this is very, very important. Now, I would prefer to give any anti-epileptic drugs as prophylaxis for two weeks and then taper and stop within another two weeks. So what is important is the duration. It should not be for more than two weeks. And also the mechanism of tapering and stopping. People generally do a cold turkey stop. That is very, very dangerous. You should take another two weeks to taper and stop. And many people are, most of the people are not aware of it. They think tapering and stopping is within three or four days. No, it should be about two weeks. You have to slowly reduce and stop. That is very, very important. Long-term anti-epileptic drug is not recommended. Now, if a patient has post-traumatic epilepsy, that should be considered like any other post-traumatic epilepsy or post-traumatic seizure. One can give a full therapy for two to three years, do an EEG and then taper over the next one to two months. Levetiracetam is a good alternative, but one should be aware that levetiracetam, you know, has a high incidence of depression uh, and so I have seen it in a significant number of my patients and uh, brevisiteram, which is a better alternative has 10 times the lesser dose and said to have less of cognitive side effects. But currently there is no evidence of brevisiteram for uh, use in head injuries. So I cannot, you know, recommend it uh, just like that. Now, if the patient has associated comorbidities, for instance, a patient has raised ICP, has a contusion. Uh, so in those conditions, it could be given for more than two weeks. So if you have a patient with severe brain swelling, don't taper and stop in two weeks. And this is something I keep on hearing. You know, people say that, how can we taper and stop if the patient is having brain swelling? No, I'm saying that you should taper and stop when the brain swelling has come back to normal. You know, there is no acute effects of head injury. That is when you should taper and stop. Not when you still have acute effects of head injury. Uh, next, we come to ICP monitoring. So, Dr. Tapes, I hope uh, the flow is okay. I hope. Yes, sir. Wonder, wonderful, sir. Wonder, wonderful. Okay. So, now ICP is something which is mandatory in all the ICUs. So, again, this is something where you just cannot have a class one evidence. It's impossible. It's like the parachute hypothesis. You know, nobody will have a class one hypothesis. So we only have level 2B where it has shown to reduce in hospital and two weeks post injury mortality. Now, what is the conclusions? Obviously, it has to be done in all salvageable patients with severe and moderate uh, trauma head injuries with abnormal computer tomography, ab ab abnormal CT scan. Uh, 
An abnormal CT scan is defined as one which reveals hematomas, contusions, swelling, herniation, compressed basal systems, etc. Now, it is also indicated in patients with severe traumatic brain injuries with a normal scan. If two or more of these criteria are noted, that is, age is more than 40 years. So, I, even the scan is normal, you know, uh, but is a severe TBI, you would still like to do an ICP monitoring. Or there is bilateral motor posturing or the systolic blood pressure, you, you know, the systolic blood pressure is not very high. Next important parameter to monitor is cerebral perfusion pressure monitoring. If there is a single important factor for head injuries in the first 24 hours, I would say it is the cerebral perfusion pressure, not anything else. ICP, yes, is important, but it comes into play, you know, after 12 hours, 24 hours, that also. But if you don't maintain a proper cerebral perfusion pressure in the first 24 hours, you are going to produce a huge amount of secondary brain damage. So we all know what is the cerebral perfusion pressure, which is, uh, you know, uh, we had had a very excellent lecture by Dr. Saurabh, so I will not repeat it. But uh, in uh, patients with traumatic brain injury, it is defined uh, as ICP minus JVP. So CPP is proportional uh, to IC, uh, ICP as well as MAP. Now recommendations, now, uh, the we don't obviously have level one but level two is that management of severe head injury patients using guidelines based recommendation for cpp to reduce the pubic mortality so management of cpp in the first 24 hours has known to significantly reduce the two-week mortality now this is a study which has been performed in about 2000 patients no it's in about uh, 2000 patients and they have shown a significant reduction uh, of mortality by maintaining good CPP. Now, what is the role of advanced cerebral monitoring? Now, I would not like to talk much about it, but obviously, you know, there, we do not have sufficient level one and level two because they're not available in all centers. Now, definitely level three jugular bulb monitoring as a source of information for management decisions may be considered to reduce mortality and improve outcomes at three and six months. So there has been one paper on this. Similarly, cerebral autoregulation monitoring with TCD, there has been a retrospective study of 300 patients and they have provided a strong relationship between TCD and a six months follow-up. Microdialysis, again, there have been some studies but it's very expensive. It's more, I would say, at least, especially for a country like India, it's more on an experimental basis. Uh, so I would not like to uh, talk much about it over here. Now, what are the thresholds? Ultimately, you know, when we talk of thresholds, I like to point out certain important thresholds based on evidence. And these are the thresholds below which these parameters should not come down. If they do, that is going to be very, very detrimental. So first is systolic blood pressure, which is very, very important. And it has been seen as early as 1989. He, Kluber has reported a mortality of 30% in patients where systolic blood pressure was not maintained properly. So if the autoregulation remains intact, a drop in systolic blood pressure, it triggers an auto-regulatory vasodilatation in attempt to maintain adequate uh, brain perfusion. So this results in increased uh, cerebral blood volume, which again can increase the ICP because of the Monroe Kelly hypothesis. But however, when the auto-regulation is not intact, then also it's harmful because when the SPB falls, that is systolic blood pressure falls, this again leads to cerebral ischemia. So in both the cases, whether the autoregulation is intact or not intact, it can have a uh, deleterious effect on the uh, brain cells. Now, the traditional definition of hypotension is a systolic blood pressure of less than 90. Is that correct? So let's examine the current evidence. So there is this study by Berry et al. who has studied 15,000 patients. And based on this, he has suggested that we should revise the criteria. It should not be 90, but it should be 110. So based on this important study, 
Now the lower threshold for systolic blood pressure is 110. So even though you see that for lower age groups, it could be about 100 and higher age groups, 110. But to be on the safer side, I think we should not let the blood pressure fall below 110 under any circumstances, because that could seriously compromise the cerebral perfusion pressure. So the current status is a recommended systolic blood pressure of 110. It's not 90, it's 110. ICP threshold, again, you know, there has been a lot of debate. Has it changed? ICP, uh, the data available is more than 25 years. So this is where I went through the recent literature to see whether there has been any further uh, guidelines for changing the ICP threshold. So again, you know, there is a study of 459 patients and they have given an ICP threshold of 22. And they have found that an ICP of less than this can lead to increased mortality. So he suggested 18 is okay for women and older, but so around 18 to 22 is what is recommended. Now for to be on the safer side, I think considering 18 is also not bad. In older patients, because they have cerebral atrophy, so you can, they can tolerate up to 22. So recommended ICP threshold is 22, but 18 is when one should become cautious. You know, moment it starts crossing 18, that is where one should become cautious and that is where all the measures to control the ICP should be put into action, not when it is crossing 22. So earlier it was 25. So there has been a significant shift of all these recommendations over the past decade. Now, what is the CPP threshold, cerebral perfusion pressure threshold? Again, there has been this study where they have studied 1700 patients. And they have said the cerebral per perfusion pressure threshold is 70 millimeters of mercury. Obviously, there is no level one evidence, but anywhere between 60 to 70 is what is recommended. So the recommendation threshold for CPP is 70. But again, when you reach to something like 60, you know, it starts falling below, uh, I would say 80, one should be very, very cautious. And below 60 is something which should alert you completely. Now I have not covered the following things because I think it's not relevant to the current audience. Uh, jugular bulb monitoring, atrial ox oxygen content difference, brain tissue oxygen monitoring, xenon CT. So I have not covered all this because I think they're not very important for the day-to-day -day management. So thank you very much once again. And I hope I have been able to give you a comprehensive idea regarding the current evidence which is available for uh, uh, management of traumatic brain injuries. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was a very comprehensive overview and I think most useful to our audience. One question has come up, sir. What is the role of acetazolamide in traumatic brain injury? So Diamox, uh, again, I didn't find any specific evidence. Uh, so I will not uh, recommend Diamox because it, one of the biggest complications of Dimox is metabolic acidosis. And that is, uh, depends whether a person is a slow acetyler or a fast acetyler. And there is no way for us to know beforehand whether this guy is a fast acetyler or slow acetyler. Uh, so we had a faculty, you know, we gave Dimox, she had a, a idiopathic, uh, and she had severe, developed severe metabolic acidosis and she had to be ventilated. She went into altered sensorium. So that's the reason I will not recommend Dimox. Uh, people use it for, uh, for, one said, for CSF abnormalities like <coughs> hydrocephalus and all. Is there any particular role there, sir? In, See, definitely. If a patient has an hydrocephalus, Dimox is very useful. For idiopathic intracranial hypertension, then it is very useful. But these are chronic conditions. And you have time to escalate the dose of Dimox slowly. So we never start with a full dose. We start with a miniature dose and we are able to monitor the consciousness of the patients. And I always prefer to increase, escalate the dose of Dimox over three to four weeks. I don't do it suddenly for chronic conditions, especially for idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And that is the reason, you know, I don't prefer it. In head injuries, it's acute condition and you give it full dose. It's definitely, I will not recommend that. Right. Sort of, uh, please, your comments and whatever you would like. Uh, I, was, I was about to say the same thing, Dr. Uh, so that was an exhaustive lecture, sir, and it's covered all the aspects of the head injury.
evidence based i will say it's an evidence based management of traumatic brain injury very well covered each and every aspect of the head injury has been covered as regards the acid dissolomide i think sir has covered the answer uh, what i wanted to say about that acute management see acid dissolomide doesn't find a place in the armory in traumatic brain injury because it's an acute thing in acute thing acid dissolomide when you which alters the csf production doesn't find a place uh, in traumatic brain injury it's generating ih choroid plexus tumors where csf production has been uh, or obstruction is there absorption is there so there there it's i don't think there is a role uh, apart from that uh, i will say uh, propofol sir has said that uh, has got uh, barbiturate has got a better role than propofol or maybe uh, that's that's a uh, good thing because barbiturate causes less of an hypotension than propofol but i will say in safe hands propofol is safe okay so it's it's not like that but uh, the most important complication of propofol is propofol infusion syndrome even when it is going to use for a longer period of time and bab the problem with the barbiturate infusion in the icu it is it is good in a severe head injury but not in a head injury in which you wanted to ventilate the patient for 24 to 48 hours because the problem of uh, checking of the gcs with barbiturate infusion is the problem uh, with propofol infusion we know that as soon as we are going to stop the propofol infusion we are going to check uh, the gcs uh, very quickly which is which is very important in uh, patients like uh, traumatic brain injuries so that's where the role of propofol is there uh, i think uh, rest of the things uh, have been covered very exhaustively if there is any particular thing you want to what about dvt prophylaxis sir if you want to comment we generally started in first 24 hours so dvt pumps generally are there or i will say the pneumatic compression devices are there right from the start in every patient sequential compression devices but uh, as far as pharmacological prophylaxis is concerned uh, concerned it depends on the type of head injury the patient is there if there is a contusion or a big hematoma which has been uh, removed uh, surgically we generally say for a next ct scan if the hematoma or the uh, hemostasis which has been done in the surgery has been stabilized for next 48 hours we generally start on a pharmacological prophylaxis for dvt as well now there is another uh, thing which i would like to comment like when i saw some of the other advanced institutions like you know i went and saw the trauma care facility at ucla i stayed there for almost one and a half years then at the inu uh, I, ini international neurosciences institute at hanover i found one difference one major difference they give highly intensive therapy for the patient in the first 24 hours they don't compromise on anything so a patient of head injury comes there is a hematoma so evacuate immediately do a decompressive now do a ct scan after that do an icp monitoring so once the ct scan is normal once the icp monitoring is okay they are not bothered about gcs they put the patient on a barbiturate coma completely so the patient is on coma for 3 4 5 days so they are not bothered as long as the icp is well maintained and they do sequential ct scans which they have in the icu itself and it shows doesn't show any further collection they are not really actually bothered about the gcs so, that's, so sir that's what i was saying that in severe head injury yes barbiturate have a, a good role it's it's a tier tier 3 therapy and we all compare it to the decompressive craniotomy as well but in a mild or moderate head injury where we wanted to go for a quick look at the gcs where propofol finds its place and not bab not uh, matlab propofol doesn't find a place in a severe traumatic brain injury no place for propofol infusion and definitely we need to monitor a continuous eg with barbiturate infusion and the goal is reduction in icp and not uh, the burst suppression that is one thing which i wanted to uh, that, is very, that because, is very important that is because 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 for the burst suppression the dose of barbiturate is quite higher and that for is... the decrease in icp the dose is lower and as you increase the uh, dose of barbiturate the most important problem which comes in is the immunosuppression so don't target burst suppression with uh, barbiturates rather than target a decreased icp with barbiturates very true i had actually shown it in one of my recommendations also yes burst suppression is not the target it's icp but i am i'm very happy you pointed it out specifically sir up i think uh, one final thing you would talk about uh, if you could about the evd and the infection associated with 
So just for our audience, if you'd like to talk a little about, because you know, EVD is uh, used to some extent, all the ICUs don't have catheters and all, and EVD infection is a problem. So maybe you'd like, just like to uh, elaborate on that EVD. So uh, as, as regards EVD is considered, considered it as a closed system. Please follow the no touch technique as far as uh, it is, uh, as far as you can do it. Don't go for repeated sampling. Don't go for uh, repeated uh, uh, change of the bags. Unless uh, what we follow generally in our institute is that once an EVD is in place, okay, it has to be drained at the head level. We might increase or decrease depending on the on the condition of the patient. But at the same time, nobody touches it unless and until it is required. Even the bag is changed after the bag is full. Okay, only then we go ahead and change the whole uh, the bag and the uh, tubing. Second thing is prophylactic as regards prophylactic antibiotics. We don't give use prophylactic antibiotics as the EVD is in for a longer period of time. We generally give a procedural antibiotic as a surgical prophylaxis in EVD only. As the time we are putting in the EVD, we give a uh, antibiotic uh, that is generally a second generation cephalosporin, cefiroxine. And uh, after that, no antibiotics Antibiotics are for the treatment and not for the prevention. And it generally gives uh, rise to resistant bugs most of the time. So this is this is how we generally maintain an EVD. We have shifted to most of the condition to uh, Omaya reservoir in which we put a reservoir. We all know that. And then we'll put a scalp pin set uh, into it. If it is, uh, the most of the time that the CSF is non-hemorrhagic. It's a clear CSF. If there is like a condition called a subarachnoid hemorrhage, we are putting a EVD, we generally put an EVD, not a Moya. So it's it's regarding that. It's, it's... Okay. Thank you, sir. Anything else you want to add? Yeah, same thing what Dr. So now EVD, the way we do it is we gen most often we try to do EVD for the acute conditions and then we convert it into Nomaya. And infections in EVD is a big, big challenge. I mean, it's something, you know, if you keep it for more than four or five days. You can be almost sure that the patient is getting infected. That's what we have seen. Uh, so, what? Uh, so that is one issue, you know, for which I don't have any clear-cut answers. Even though in the literature they say, give these guidelines and all that, and I have seen these issues even in the best of centers. Moment they keep it more than four or five days, the infection rate goes up dramatically. Uh, so uh, this is something you know for which I don't have actually any answers. People have suggested antibiotic impregnated, but I don't think that makes a big difference. The advantage of OMEA is that you can definitely it reduces the infection, I feel. But the issue with OMEA is that you're not doing a continuous drainage. So maybe in acute situation, you can use an EVD and in a chronic situation, you can use OMEA. But I think the best strategy is if you have raised ICP in our setting we found, go ahead and do a large decompressive do ICV monitoring for the next one or two days. Definitely it comes down below 18. So moment it comes down, remove the ICP in one or two days. Do a CT scan, you find a lot of space. So I think that that would be the best way to manage in our city situation, conditions. Right, thank Dr. you. Dr. Yeah. Kapil, as, as regards the ICP also, so you don't consider that as a number only. You have to look at the waveform also. That's Another true. thing what I wanted to point it out is that uh, if you just look at the pure number of ICP of 22, if the contusions or the uh, hematoma is near the temp near the midbrain, like a temporal or a basifrontal region, consider an ICP value of low or even 15 to 18 is sufficient enough to take the patient to a surgery. Uh, I will say it's a time bomb sitting there. So don't consider that as a number of surgery. It's the ICP is still less than 22 and we are not going to treat it. No, you if, if it is in a specific, supposedly if a patient has got a decompressive craniotomy already been done. And after that also, if, uh, your ICP is showing a raise and it is reaching a 15 to 18. Let me go ahead for do a CT scan. You might find that you need to go in again. So these are the things uh, which the intensivist should know because if he is not going to point out there, we, he might uh, the people uh, the patient might lose the time because we all know the time is brain in these, these kind of conditions. So that's one more thing I just remember. Yeah, it's very out. true. It's very true. Absolutely. So I think uh, sir, anything else you want to, uh, to add, sir, Dr. Chandra, sir? No, nothing else. Sort of anything from your side? 
No, I think that has been extensively covered. Uh, if there is any question from your end or from the audience, and we can no, make... I think that is uh, all. Uh, there is no more question also, and I think the topic uh, uh, Professor Chandra sir has uh, covered extensively. Uh, thank him uh, for that, and uh, thank you, Saurabh, for joining in. And once and again, I would like to remind the audience that previous lectures where uh, Professor Chandra sir and Saurabh sir were involved. Uh, have been taken. You can go through our YouTube channel. They are up there. The subarachnoid hemorrhage, intracranial hemorrhage, ICT, and stroke. Stroke was taken by Dr. Padma Shivatov and uh, status epilepticus by Dr. Manjari Tripathi. So that is extensive coverage of neurocritical care and uh, whatever else is required in future we shall cover. But this is core neurocritical care. You can go through the lectures uh, on our YouTube channel. And with that, I thank uh, everybody again, the audience and uh, the Cipla Pharmaceuticals for providing the digital platform. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tapesh.